Hi, Paul. Hey, Bob. How you doing? I'm great. Good to be on with you. Good to be on with you. Uh, let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show on Blogging Heads TV. And you are Paul Zack, <clears throat> among other things, the author of The Moral Molecule, The Source of Love and Prosperity. You're also a professor of economic psychology and management at, at Claremont, right? Okay. University in, in California? In Southern California. You have an old copy of the book. Here's, look how pretty the cover is. This is a pretty one. You're saying yours is prettier than mine? It is. You've got the advanced copy. Yeah. I think that's the yeah. advanced reader. That's because I'm an advanced reader. So I got the advanced yeah. reader copy. And you're just you're just like an elementary reader. You have the, all, you have the inside scoop, you know, which is worse. Yeah. So now you have hard questions for me. So you also run this center for something. And conveniently, the logo for that is uh, on your apparel, even as we speak, I think, right? right? The right. center for right. what? Neuroeconomic studies. So neuroeconomics measures brain activity while people make decisions. And so, you know, Bob, I know you've never made a bad decision in your life, but never. you've heard of people who have made bad decisions, and we have such big brains. I'm married to one, in fact, but yeah. So, you know, there's really no evolutionary reason I can think of that we should be able to articulate the inner workings of our decision-making processes. So we, we interrogate the brain while people make decisions, understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, and potentially how to improve those decisions. Okay, and this methodology led you to do some truly path-breaking research on the moral molecule, whose identity I guess we might as well reveal at this point, right? We're talking about oxytocin. Oxytocin, right. Not, not oxycontin, the, uh, the pain reliever, but oxytocin, which is a natural chemical your brain makes. And the, the short background on that, as you know, is until about 10 years ago when we started doing these behavioral neuroscience experiments, Oxytocin was only known to be associated with childbirth and breastfeeding in women, and was really unstudied in humans because it, it, um, there was no disorder, medical disorder, associated with too much or too little of it. And yet in animals, there was this rich literature suggesting that in group living animals, oxytocin uh, allowed for the toleration of burrow mates. And so I thought, well, gee, if I'm interested in morality, toleration is kind of one edge of that continuum. And if I can crank that up a little bit, Maybe this is an interesting mechanism that motivates pro-social or moral behaviors. Okay. And on this, uh, you mentioned uh, mothers giving birth. Um, and and some, some mothers may be familiar with the synthetic version of oxytocin, which is Pitocin, which is given to induce labor, right? Correct. And I assume it's, it's like no coincidence that uh, this chemical is associated with giving birth and that at birth, Mothers generally have ve very favorable feelings toward their offspring. We think we think oxytocin is involved in those favorable feelings. That's right. So oxytocin is an anxiolytic, so it reduces stress, um, gives people a sense of calm and focus. And in fact, women who give birth naturally versus cesarean, by some measures, bond better to their infants. They have lower rates of postpartum depression, postpartum psychosis. So this system is really set up to bond. Um, particularly mothers, but in some species like humans, fathers to offspring. So what we found in these experiments after 10 years is that not only does oxytocin make us care about our kids and our spouses, we care about complete strangers. And for us, this is interesting. Now, based on your book, um, Not Zero Sum and The Moral Animal, you know, these, this uh, gives us the ability to at least temporarily care about complete others, which means we can derive value from a very large set of individuals around us, not just these small kin-based groups. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, and I gather that, that that fact will figure into our, uh, our elaboration on the, the meaning of the subtitle, The Source of Love and Prosperity, which we will get to. But first, let's talk about these experiments that, that you did that, that fleshed this out, the way it could affect our feeling towards other people, okay? You were, I think, uh, the first person to do this, to look at oxytocin levels in the context of these games that behavioral economists set up to uh, study the way people interact with each other, particularly in kind of non-zero-sum situations. So what's, what's an example of one of these, these games where trust uh, becomes an important question, whether you, whether you trust the other person? Right. So I'm just going to give you a 30 second background. So from the late 90s, showing that uh, measures of interpersonal trust on the country level were among the strongest predictors economists have ever found of which countries would be prosperous and which would be mired in poverty. So okay. rich countries are by and large high trust countries, poor countries are low trust, 
Trust is kind of a lubricant for economic transactions. When trust is high, we can shake hands, do a deal, and then there are more wealth-creating transactions. So, so my interest in trust initially was in you know, how do we design institutions and environments which trust would be high or low. And this work had a lot of impact, and the World Bank buys me out. Well, how do we raise trust in developing countries? But you know, a question I always got was, well, how, you know, why do two people in a given country ever trust each other? So this experiment was meant to look at the underlying foundation for trusting a stranger. So here's the task, and this was a task invented by Bernard Smith, who uh, won the Nobel Prize for inventing experimental economics. So uh, you, we heard a bunch of people for this experiment. They all agreed to get uh, participate. They get $10 for sitting in these hard wooden chairs for an hour and a half. And we give them lots of instruction in this task. I'm going to do a single task in this experiment. And here's the task. So you log in with a secret number to mask your identity. So you can do whatever you want. You get paid by a cashier, you know, in the hallway who's not part of the experiment. So you can be as good or bad as you want with money. So within this, when you log in, you're matched by only with the, the person in the lab. But you don't know who that person is, and you can't talk to him or her. Within that matching, there's a first decision maker and a second decision maker. And after lots of instruction without any deception, because we're the good behavior guys, we want, wouldn't want to deceive people, uh, the first decision maker gets a prompt by computer saying, do you want to give up some of the $10 you earned for being here and ship it to the person you've been matched to in the lab? Whatever you give up comes out of your account, but it's tripled in the other person's account. Right? So if you give up, say, any of your $10, you keep two, that person now has 24. So now the second person gets a prompt by computer saying, uh, guy one sent you, say, $24. The total in your account is 34 You want to send some amount back to the first person. And does the first person, by the way, know that the second person is going to have the option of sending money back? Absolutely. So everyone knows everything. And what if the second person returns, comes out of their account one-to-one, -one, is not tripled? So the, the so this task has been run, you know, for very large states, uh, you know, three-month salary, average salary in Bulgaria, on and on. And the consensus view in experimental economics was that the transfer from guy one to guy two is a measure of trust. It's not altruism, because I'm saying, again, because we all know that the pie can grow. Hey, guy, the pie, you know, these crazy experiments make this pie get big. I'm hoping, believing, trusting that you're going to get it and share some of that largesse back with me. Um, and then the return transfer we could call reciprocity or trustworthiness. So economists are actually flummoxed on why the second person would ever return money. Because you know the underlying assumption is that money's good, mm -hmm. and you are being being tortured in this experiment. Why don't you keep it all? And you're not going to repeat the thing, so it's not like you need you want to establish an ongoing relationship with exactly. the person. Right. So this is this is an extremely stark case in which it removes all, all these personal cues, chatting, smiling. Uh, you know, I don't know. And and so our idea was that if you could induce oxytocin release from this computer generated personal but mostly depersonalized stimulus then imagine in person what would happen. So that's indeed what we found. We found that the more money someone received denoting trust, the more their brain produced oxytocin, and the more oxytocin they had on board, the more money they reciprocated. So it means we have an underlying biology for reciprocation, and in that reciprocation comes all the kinds of economic systems that we put in place, which essentially the golden rule. You play nice, I play nice. So we can talk later about what happens when people don't play nice, the underlying biology of punishment, which is really interesting too. But about 95% of the people on our experiments, and you know, hundreds of people who run this on now, who receive money, they release oxytocin, or return at least some of it. So, so, so when we say that what this person did inspired trust in me, trust of them, apparently what's happening at the physical level is that oxytocin is being released. That's what mediates the, the feeling of trust. That's right. And so a way to think about this is that you know, this molecule that evolved to motivate care for offspring makes us treat strangers like offspring or like family, at least temporarily. But again, in that, we can extract value. Sometimes that's economic value, but it can also be social value. They can become friends, romantic partners, whatever. So, you know, to me, you know, unless you have something in your head that says, look, Bob seems safe, he seems fine to be around, and, I don't know, Joe doesn't seem safe, you can't mm -hmm. have strangers living and working together. So you don't have civilization, you don't have specialization of labor, and you don't have the ability to grab those positive sum games, unless mm -hmm. you have this mechanism. Again, it's not perfect, and we can talk about all the ways other chemicals in the brain buffet the system, but on the first cut, this is what's kind of motivating us to get together and find these zero uh, positive sum solutions. Sorry. Okay. So then uh, you did a second round of experiments in which you 
artificially manipulated the level of oxytocin, right? I mean, the first exper experiment just showed that oxytocin, in fact, rises as these feelings of trust grow uh, and, then, and then lead to the, re the reciprocation. Uh, but then you did a second round of experiments. We did. So I should say, just to cap the first experiment, that was the first known non-reproductive stimulus to induce oxytocin release. So this is actually pretty big news. And oxytocin is really shy molecules, so it's actually hard to coax it out of the brain. It disappears rapidly. So there's a bunch of technical so, hurdles that required us. So this, this is the first time it was documented in humans that oxytocin mediates relationships beyond the family. Exactly right. Yeah, beyond actually beyond just reproduction and, and birth. So okay. So this is so what we're doing is we're establishing a, a protocol that other people can use and have used now for ten years to actually measure you know the strength of social relationships. So so to move on to the second experiment. So then we realized or I realized right away that you know to really show even though we measured nine other hormones, especially nine hormones that interact with oxytocin, they don't have an effect in this in this task. We really have to go and manipulate oxytocin directly to see if we could cause trusting behavior. Right, so first we showed half the circle, which is, if, if I'm trusted, I release oxytocin and I reciprocate, but now I want to go back and close the circle and say, look, if I go and manipulate the system, I can make you trusting. So we have this really big drill. We started drilling in people's... No. You're kidding. We didn't do that. So what we did is we, uh, I discovered that there's this nasal inhaler that was FDA approved to help women initiate breastfeeding. It went off the market in the U.S., but was still sold in Europe. So I thought, beautiful, I'll just import this stuff from Europe. It's generic drug, it's very cheap. And uh, the FDA, in their infinite wisdom, for two years said, you can't do it. And uh, after, you know, lots of this, I finally called up uh, a young psychologist in Switzerland who sent me his doctoral dissertation, in which he had infused oxytocin and looked at stress responses, social stressors. I said, look, I have this golden idea. I'm going to trust you. Hey, big word for me. I'm going to trust you with this idea. So I think, you know, I want to run this in your lab because I cannot run it in the U.S. And so the same thing. So same experiment, trust experiment, half the people on oxytocin, half on placebo. And not only could we cause people to be more trusting, we more than doubled the number of people who sent all their money to a stranger. So, you know, mm -hmm. really big size facts. People were cognitively intact. They didn't take, let's say, gamble. We had these gambling tasks. They didn't take more risk. They knew where they were. They, you know, could add up numbers. So it really seems to be just this social molecule that's, engaging us with others. So if you were a con man, you could abuse this technology, right? Little little, little vaporizer subtly uh, concealed and, and uh, get people to trust you. And Yeah, in fact, you know, we, you remember the story from the book, there's a chapter in yeah, the you, you were a victim of a... A con when I was 18 years old, a classic con. And I kind of break down the neuroscience of cons. So yeah, so it would certainly be illegal to spritz it in the air. In fact, we put about two teaspoons of liquid up your nose, you definitely mm -hmm. don't be getting it. So, mm -hmm. so there's, there's no, there's some internet products that claim they're oxytocin, they're not, because it's a prescription drug. You can't sell it without a prescription. But yeah, so con men often, classic cons often involve the con man not, not getting the victim to trust him, but showing that he trusts the victim. Right? And now from this research, we know why that works. Right? I show he trusts you, your brain leases oxytocin, and boom, now you want to reciprocate. So this, mm -hmm. so, so a lot of classic cons involve the, the con men being um, uh, needing help or being a victim somehow and, and being under distress and, and asking you, please, you good person, would you just please help me? I don't know what to do. If I could just get a hundred bucks, boom. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so actually, this this being caught at age eighteen, kind of interest was a sort of spur for me to study human mm -hmm. behavior. Uh, this is weird. The humans aren't all nice. How interesting is that? Now, do we know, by the way, uh, whether the drug ecstasy leads to the release of oxytocin? It sounds to me like it would. It does. So just in the last year, this has been shown that, that uh, ecstasy does cause oxytocin release. Again, it makes people feel very close to each other. But for the kids watching, we know ecstasy, you know, is not a good thing to take. You know, it'll put, you know, Swiss cheese holes in your brain with just a couple. Always, always Instead of getting the Swiss cheese holes in your in your brain, actually go to Switzerland and get the inhaler. That's what we're telling kids, right? So I should say now we have FDA approval to uh, you know I make these in my bathroom at home. Make oxytocin inhalers, not exactly, but we can we can safely run these. So we've now run uh, my lab has run oh, seven or eight hundred people now safely on the oxytocin inhaler for lots of different experiments. We've never had one person say I have a headache or a tummy ache. So you know this is very safe because it, your body's making this anyway. Do they report that, like, uh, I mean, do they have, like, a hangover where they're in a low-trust 
mode or anything. Nothing, you know. I mean, I mean, I think, I think, I think, uh, ecstasy probably has that ha, ha, has some kind of hangover of of that sort. In other words, you you get kind of the reverse effect twelve hours later or whatever. Yeah, you know, ecstasy is, is a lot more subtle. So sometimes I I uh, talk about the chemicals in the brain as sort of rocket thrusters. Right, so I'm moving around the sea of strangers, and I have to kind of move this way, move that way. So sometimes I see someone, and I need to be aggressive towards them. I need or I need to flee. And other times I want to move towards them. And so oxytocin is a very subtle kind of safety measure. So, again, it's not a, it's not a point from zero to 100. It's more like I'm neutral. I see you, and I go to 55 or 60. Um, so there are a couple tells that we've seen in experiments that might tell you someone's oxytocin, but... Um, I don't know, 15% of the people in experiments we give oxytocin to, they just suppress this, this you know, evolutionary old signal that's, you know, subcortical. It's very old. It says, oh, this is safe. You can interact with this person. So that's, I think, what's going on. Is this, the safety signal goes on. Again, you can suppress it mm-hmm. with the prefrontal cortex and go, hey, it seems safe, but, you know, I really need the money because my student loan's late. This is actually what a student told us in a debriefing. Why do I keep all the money? My student loan was late. I really needed it. So even though it felt like I should reciprocate, you know, they suppress it. <laughs> Right. Okay. Now, in addition to being connection between uh, connect, between oxytocin and trust, there's a connection with empathy, which is kind of kind of related to trust in a way, right? And you, and you've you talk about that in the book. So right. So we so after we show that it facilitates reciprocation, we also show that it, even in, in zero sum settings, oxytocin makes people more generous. When being generous means you're losing money, and we start thinking about you know a variety of other virtuous behaviors. But in terms of putting context around that, one question was, what's it feel like when your brain releases oxytocin? So we had this, this experiment where we watch a very short 100-second video of a father and son, and the son has terminal brain cancer. And of course, the son the son's two years old. He doesn't know he's going to die. The, the father does. It's a weeper. People are very affected by it. it causes a huge release in oxytocin. And we just have people write adjectives. You know, how do you feel? And after this video, they felt two things. They felt distressed, of course. There's a little child who's going to die. And they also felt empathic. And the change in oxytocin was positively correlated with their sense of empathy. So this is this is valuable now. So why am I going to reciprocate with you? Why am I generous towards you? Because I'm getting a sense of what you're feeling. I'm kind of connecting to you emotionally. And this brings us right into Adam Smith. So Adam Smith, the father of economics, so famous for the author of nations, as you know, was also a moral philosopher. Actually, not also, he was a moral philosopher. And I think his best book was the 1759 Theory of Moral Sentiments, which took this obscure uh, you know, philosophy professor from Edinburgh who would, you know, wander around in his pajamas and live with his mom his whole life. He became a rock star. You know? Is that part true? It's true, yeah. I he didn't was, know that about it. He, so he could have been a blogger if he was around today. Well, he'd be perfect blogger. But yeah. all of a sudden, you know, he, he wrote a little on the long side for that. But aside from that, he never shorted. So he's having you know dinner with the King of France and hanging out with Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. But why? Because in this book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, he developed the first uh, full terrestrial theory of morality. And he said we're moral because we have what we call mutual sympathy. We would call that empathy. So. If I do something that hurts you, and I share your emotions, at least to some extent, that hurts me, so I tend to avoid mm-hmm. that. And if I do something that brings you joy, I get to share that joy. Mm-hmm. And so all some people went, oh my gosh, we don't, we don't need God or government to make us moral. We can be moral by this biology. So we've in fact found the underlying mechanism that, that Adam Smith talked about, which is oxytocin, which makes us feel empathy, which just makes us more connected to others emotionally, which makes us treat them well, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, you've got a little a little uh, chart in your book, the virtuous circle, right? Very nice. That's right. So once we have this, then we have this nice virtuous circle. So one of the think key issues in the book, Bob, is is that I can't make my own brain release oxytocin, but I can't release it in you. And if I release it in you, for ninety five percent of the people we trusted, you're going to reciprocate one of these release it in me. Now we have this virtuous circle. So oxytocin is sometimes called the love molecule. It's a, you know, it makes parents care for their offspring. And so it's like love. You, you can't force someone to love you. You can just give your love to them and then hope they reciprocate. So this is kind of interesting because someone has to initiate this kind of virtuous circle. And, um, uh, you know, I got this nickname, Dr. Love, because, you know, uh, 
I started hugging everybody because we so touch with these oxytocin. So as, you know, I'm always the first subject of my own experiment. So, so let me try this experiment on myself. And I'm an introvert, so I get kind of tired talking to people. Not that I'm shy, I just, you know. Anyway, so I just started hugging everybody. So anyway, some magazine picked this up. Yeah, uh, I mean, explain uh, this to me. So you, you say in the book you hugged, like, everyone who walks into your office or something like that? So I started doing this in my lab. I got 35 people in my lab. So I just started refusing the handshake and hugging people. And then this reporter from Fast Company a couple years Can I just pause and say that people like you make me extremely uncomfortable? But now go ahead. So what I need to infer. Because I'm an introvert, except I'm a real one. Like, I don't think I could turn myself into somebody who hugs everyone, okay? So, so part of this was self-experimentation, but there's evidence in the animal literature that you can, with repeated oxytocin exposure, you can lower the threshold for releasing oxytocin. So I'm going to try that on myself. So would it make me better connecting to others if I just started hugging everybody? Because we showed that touch releases oxytocin. And indeed, I found that in my own life, that I'm much more connected to people. So I was in the Chicago yesterday, as you know, and doing some book events, and I also had some meeting, business meetings. And so I go to this big, you know, 30-story office building, and people put their hands on it and say, I don't shake hands, I hug. Oh, man. What happens is people smile, they give you a hug, they smile, and all of a sudden, you're close to them. And then you get down to what you really want to do, which is, hey, what are we going to get out of this relationship? We really want, we both want something out of this. Let's cut to the, to the chase and get to what we really want. It's a stupid thing, but it actually seems to work. So again, if it works to, for me, introvert, might even work for you. I'm, I'm skeptical of your claim that you're an introvert, frankly. I, I, I think this is a con. I think you're trying to inspire trust and empathy in me. I and just in, play one on TV, an extrovert. Yeah, you must. Um, yeah, now, there, now, is there a literature yet on the effect of touch per se? I know um, uh, Dacker Kelter, you probably know him at Berkeley, has written about some of this. He's done studies of of NBA teams that are high touch and low touch. Has anybody actually looked at the effects of sheer uh, touching and, and hugging on oxytocin level in the laboratory? Yeah, we have, so in two studies. So just, just imagine the experiment because it's fun to describe in 60 seconds, which is you come and you get a blood draw, you go in a room and a professional massage therapist gives you a 15 minute back massage, you have a blood draw, do the trust game. So no problem recruiting for this experiment, believe me. Sure. Um, and then we had a control group that just rested quietly on a different day. So it was a study on relaxation. So people didn't know they were getting a massage. So we showed a couple of things. One, that massage induces oxytocin release. Massage, followed by signal of trust, doubles the effect. We get enormous amounts of reciprocation. And we reduce anxiety with touch, and we improve the immune system. So I think what this is telling us is why, as you know, uh, having a rich social network is very protective against health and early death. Uh, so why is a social protective network protective of, of health? Of health, yeah. yeah. So why, why is social network better? Because probably we're getting a lot of touch, a lot of interaction, we're getting our social release, which is de-stressing and improving the immune system. It's really consistent with it. It sounds all good. Yeah. It's all uh, so this is so we're getting at what you mean by your subtitle, the source of love and prosperity. Yeah. The prosperity part. Well, I guess it makes sense. It, it allows you to engage in these economic non-zero-sum relationships, right? Um, you know, because trust is involved in, in lots of transactions. Right. I mean, I think we're back to Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations. So Smith said prosperity is limited by the extent of the market. So right, if your market's really small, you don't have that many trading opportunities. So I think what oxytocin does is it makes this, gives us this really broad market to interact with people. Because now I can have, again, a sort of quick and dirty, emotional old assessment of, are you likely to be trustworthy? And if I can find that, then I can find a lot of trading partners and, again, create wealth. Mm -hmm. And then, now, what when you, I'm sorry, when you create wealth, you lift people out of poverty, and they have less survival stress, and stress is, high stress is an inhibitor of oxytocin release. Those people move out of poverty, they have the luxury of releasing oxytocin, behaving in moral and trustworthy ways, which means they're more likely to engage in transactions with strangers, and you have another virtuous circle going on. How cool is that? So if that were true, if this is a prediction from the neuroscience, we should see that in, in cross-country data. So in the last chapter of the book, as you know, we show tolerance levels, trustworthiness levels, even happiness levels of a nice income gradient. So you know, more money in general is good. I agree with that. More money is good. Um, so. And we've talked about 
kind of the love part, including in, in, in maybe what you might say is the purest sense, which is a, a parent's love of offspring. What about in the realm of what you might call romance, which may or may not lead to love in an enduring sense, but, you know, courtship and things like that. I mean, has that been well studied? I would certainly assume uh, that, you know, trust levels have to do are related to things like, you know, willingness to sleep with people and stuff like that, right? Right. And so another potent oxytocin releaser is, by both sexes, is sex. Um, so, again, you have this nice antilytic effect, and then you want to sort of cuddle and be with the person. But here's the kicker. In every experiment we've run in 10 years, women release more oxytocin than men. So in the laboratory, they tend to be more trustworthy, more generous. But from a sexual perspective, they're going to feel stronger sense of attachment to their sexual partner than men do. You're talking about after the sex? Mm -hmm. or After the you know, sex. Th I think I actually predicted this in The Moral Animal in 1994. I swear. I mean, I said in theory, in, according to Darwinian theory, uh, I think I maybe even mentioned oxytocin, but, but uh, I think I did. But, but, but in theory, sex um, should be more likely to strengthen the bond from the woman's point of view, because she's now, in biological terms, made a bigger investment in a certain sense than the man has. Whereas the man, the man may well swoon and be totally won over and, and, and feel invested, but it, it's the logic is not as clear cut. The man may not, um, and, and so I think I predicted that uh, that that oxytocin levels would go up more in females after a sexual encounter. And you're saying that's true. Uh, so it's true that women in every experiment run at least more than men, but the system is even more interesting. So let's just take a minute on this only because you brought it up. When a woman is ovulating, she has high levels of estradiol, which increases the number of oxytocin receptors and makes uh, her kind of a sponge for oxytocin. So not only you know does she release more oxytocin in general than men do, but when she's fertile, she's going to be really all about it. So isn't now Now, that's... Uh, not just after sex, but in general? So in that week or so when she's, uh, yeah. in, you know, ovulating and she has an egg on board, yeah, high levels of estradiol means much more sensitive to oxytocin. Much more sensitive to it. Yeah. I mean, I'd be kind of surprised if when a woman is ovulating, she is more indiscriminately trusting of men, because I would think that it's at that point that she wants to be the most careful about what sex partner is actually allowed to inseminate her. Right. right. So there's, another, you know, there's another factor that slows down that effect, which is progesterone, which is also high when you're ovulating, which blocks the binding of oxytocin receptors. So now we have this system that's modulating as close as possible. Do I really love him? Will he stay with me? Yeah, I'm really attached to him. Versus, right. ooh, maybe he's not the right guy for me. Maybe it's just a one-time deal where I'm getting good genes. So again, you know, once you get into the physiology, it's absolutely fascinating what evolution has done. And, but very complicated, and it sounds like we're just getting started on it. We are. Again, I think in this reproductive realm, we have a lot of, um, there is a growing literature, but I think in the non-reproductive setting, which is, you know, most of our lives, even though we might prefer otherwise, you know, we're, we're interacting with strangers all the time. And so, mm -hmm. you know, how do we do that? How do we, so I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, there's, I work in Claremont. There's this little dry cleaner, this little Korean lady, and you know, I've been going there for 15 years. I have no idea what she charges me. I mean, honestly, she sews my buttons on. She knows my name. So even though we say, well, it's just business, it's not personal, I think it's very difficult not to personalize these transactions. Mm -hmm. And I really like her. I, she's chatty. She's, you know, I see her. She talks to me. Um, it's like the greeter at Walmart, right? So I know they're there for, you know, stop shoplifting and all that. But you see this nice little retired guy, like, welcome to Walmart. You kind of look happy. And, and, you know, it puts a face on this giant corporation. So it, I think, you know, it's part of our underlying human nature that we want to have these personal interactions and we can't help but personalize many of the things that go on. Yeah. Now, to get back to the romance for a second, I mean, I, I assume that, well, let's look at these, you, you know, these, what's it called, the game or something? You know, you know these, these people I, who uh, coach you know, males who I guess have not had as much success with women as they would like, and they teach them basically how to seduce women, right? 
Now, I, I assume that, uh, that one of the things they're teaching them is how to raise the oxytocin level of a woman you don't know very well, right? Right. And so, so there's an underlying evolutionary question here, which is, for example, in, even in the trust game, if no one's watching, why would you trust a stranger, number one? And then why is this reproductive hormone involved? So we see in these experiments, you know, mostly with young people, although we also use free roaming humans as well, they behave about the same way as college students. People line up to get paid, and then there's a lot of flirting going on, right? And so the, the problem is that social creatures, we're actually really good at picking up, not, not perfect, but good at picking up people who are lying to us. So I think it's like the peacock's tail. If you want to show that you're generous with resources, you're a good long-term, potential long-term mate, you actually have to be a reciprocator because in line they say, well, what did you do? Oh, I returned all the money. You don't hear people saying, I was a complete bastard. I took right. the sucker for everything he's worth. That's not attractive to potential right. banks. Now, I talked to, one of, to somebody who had actually been through one of these courses about how to pick up women. He said, one thing you do is you walk up, two women are chatting in a bar, and you walk up and say, listen, can I ask you a question? I've got this younger cousin who's got this problem. And right there you're establishing that you're the type of person who would be concerned about this younger cousin. Now, of course, it's all a lie, but you're trying to inspire trust in them and presumably raise their oxytocin level. And I mean, what this gets at is that the molecule, you know, it, it does a lot of good stuff, but it also is something that can be manipulated to, to deceive people. I mean, we mentioned actual con artists, but, I, but, but I'm suggesting that in everyday life, in romance and in business and things, the, you know, there, there are things that are maybe fall short of an out-and-out -out con in the classic sense, but do involve trying to elevate people's oxytocin levels uh, more than is actually in their interest, right? I mean, and, 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 and isn't that kind of finely woven into the fabric of interaction? Sure. And again, you know, the, the eventual decision is made in the prefrontal cortex, this executive area of the brain. And again, you can suppress this safety signal if you want to. So let, let's flip the question on, on his head. Who are the 5% who don't get the oxytocin response? So these individuals never reciprocate money. They keep it all. Um, a couple percent of that 5% are psychopaths, and we can actually pick them up on, on personality surveys. They have a large number of sexual partners. They, you know, they don't attach to one person at a time. They're deviant. They always want to come back in the experiment the next day because, you know, they just found suckers to take advantage of. <laughs> we found that a couple percent are people with uh, really severe... Uh, severely bad childhood histories. So the studies we've done with sexually abused women, I mean, repeated sexually abused women, about half those don't release oxytocin on stimulus, and they have very uh, strange social behaviors. They're all clinically depressed, some, a lot of borderline personality disorders. So I can sort of, you know, so you can be born a psych, you know, like a psychopath, bad genes. You can sort of be an acquired psychopath. You're abused and neglected for a long period of time. This brain system just doesn't develop that processes oxytocin. Um, and the third is, as I mentioned before, very high levels of stress. So even you, wonderful Bob Wright, have behaved, you know, in, in a nasty way once in a while. You have a really bad day and you're grumpy and, right? So now you're, even though you're, you should be really nice to your spouse or your whatever, or your colleagues, you're not because your body says, I'm in survival mode and it's all about me getting through the next 20 minutes. The hell with you guys, right? So then you have to the next day back to work and go, man, was I a jerk yesterday? I'm so sorry. <laughs> You know, because you got to repair that relationship. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so that's what we're finding in these experiments as well. Okay. Um, and does it, uh, how does knowing about the molecule affect your life? I mean, you're, you're presumably uh, more conscious of oxytocin than just about anyone on the planet, right? Right. And so, so how does it affect the way you think about these changes in your own feelings in the course of a day? That's a good point, and I think also the way you interact with, with people. So I kind of, you know, if you don't believe your own research, no one else should do it. So I haven't actually rearranged my whole life because of this. Hugging is one example of that, but even as a, as a leader, I run a department and a lab, so I, you know, I got people who are looking to me to make decisions, and, and I would see my job as helping them be successful. And so I think from a leadership perspective, you know, I used to be all about kitten numbers, Here's your job, get this done, you gotta have it done by Friday, you know, no whining. But I've been actually much more successful at getting people to hit their marks and be successful by kind of opening up this empathy channel over here. Because again, you're not just a machine, you're a fully realized human being. And so just plugging into 
are you doing okay? You look, you look tired today. Is there something I can do to help you? Oh, yeah, my dog was sick all night or my mom was sick. And, and providing the, sometimes it's just words, just listening and saying, well, I'm really sorry about that. There's something I can do to help. Or sometimes it's, you know what, maybe you need to go solve that problem. Can someone cover your work today? And then you can come back refreshed tomorrow and cover somebody else. Really kind of keying into human beings as, you know, fully realized. Even things like, I got, you know, I've been, I've been in the road for 16 days, as you know, for the book. And you've been kick, kicking in like the, the uh, flight attendants on the airplanes. You know, we're tired. You work awfully hard. And, you know, chatting with them and, and building those relationships. And I would say, gee, you look like you've had a long day. And just, just opening up that, that window, let me tell you, I mean, I'm not saying it's a selfish thing, but all of a sudden, you know, I'm getting, oh, you know, we had extra wine in first class. Would you like a well, whatever? <laughs> no, so you're, you're building So this is a con. So you're conning the stewardess. But you know what? They're happier and I'm happier. I'm, I'm building relationships. And so I'm not saying that's a con because, again, if I'm lying or whatever, it's not going to work. But you're just plugging into how people are doing it. So in my family, I have little kids. So mm-hmm. when we're out for some kind of activity, out for some adventure, purely electronics. I want to key on you. I want to make sure you're the most important thing. So the, the love part in the book is actually important. I want to um, treat the people around me, and love here is philia, not, you know, romantic love. I want to give you as much love and attention and care as possible. Okay, so this is kind of funny to me, that thinking about the physical manifestation of trust and love and empathy has changed your life, as I take it, because in principle... You could have all of these thoughts about love and, and trust and so on without thinking about the physical molecule. I mean, it's long been a safe assumption that there was something physical going on. Right. Um, and all the things you're saying now about the way love and trust work are basically things we, we kind of knew, right? Sure. So how, how is it that, that, that the thinking about the, the, the physical dimension has has these good effects, I guess. I, I guess it's like meditation or prayer or any, you know, practice in which you're uh, forcing yourself to reach outside a little bit and realize that as social creatures, the more we're embedded in our social group, the more successful and happy we're going to be. And by the way, I, I should tell you this, uh, the, the last chapter of the book is about happiness. And we've actually found that individuals who release the most oxytocin when they're trusted are more satisfied in their lives or happier. Why? better romantic relationships, more close friends, closer to their family, and even return more money to strangers in this trust task. By the way, they have more sex with fewer partners as well. So on every level, they're connecting better to the people around them. So if there's a health benefit, if there's a happiness benefit, don't I want to create that world? So I think, again, the, the neuroscience suggests you actually can create this world. So I'm going to do it in a thoughtful way as opposed to just a willy-nilly way. And I think it's, again, my own experience has worked. So here's, again, a concrete example. I just turned 50, as you know, you missed my birthday party. But um, I had four surprise birthday parties. I'm like, I mean, I've never had, even when I was eight, I didn't have four surprise birthday parties. So I had, a, I had, I had as an introvert, I built up a bigger network of people who seemed to care about me. And it was absolutely overwhelming. And almost, Wait, but did you build them up during the introvert phase or during this phase when you've been hugging everyone? Yeah. I mean, is this a result of your recent behavior? Yeah, I think it's a recent behavior. It's the hugging. It's the hugging. So that's why I don't get surprise birthday parties? <laughs> yeah, it's all about the love. They love you. They just you have to show it back. Huh. I should tell them that I love them. So th- this thing you're, the thing you said that, that uh, people with um, higher responsiveness, their oxytocin is responsive to trust, Suggest that, I mean, if you could manipulate the genome in a way that would increase human welfare and the happiness of individual people, it might be to tune this trigger upward in, in people who right now have kind of a dull trigger. I, I mean, that it could be as simple as, th- as that, that, that you're, you're not releasing enough oxytocin when someone makes a certain kind of overture towards you. Right. And we do, there's a check in the book on the clinical applications. And... You know, again, my PhD is in, in uh, economics, so I'm an economist. I know I'm trained in neuroscience. There's a ton of clinical trials going on for autism, for schizophrenia, social anxiety disorder. Um, and so I'm involved with some of those. Other people are doing them. This, this is sort of an amazing thing that we actually have a target now to improve people's social lives, particularly patients. Um, and by the way, none of these are cures. Replacing oxytocin does not cure any of these disorders. Um, but, yeah, so there's, there's some interesting pharmaceuticals that are in uh, – development now 
to increase the number of receptors for oxytocin and make the really? release and more sensitive to it. Um, so they, there is some hope there. But even so, that that would have the very effect I'm talking about. Exactly right. And so again, you'd want to deploy that in a careful way. That's why, the, by the way, that the solution is not the oxytocin and nasal mm -hmm. spray. It's because that's, that's a sledgehammer, right? So now I'm losing this right. rated response. So your own oxytocin release has a three minute half life. So I turn it on, I see Bob. And I don't want to leave that, that moral switch on because I might run into, right. you know. Because then you might run into somebody who doesn't deserve it as much as me. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly right. Who I don't love as much. Exactly. So is the mechanism that these uh, pharmaceuticals harness comparable to the uh, SSRI mechanism where, uh, where, where, what is it? I mean, in that case, it sounds like not. But in that case, I gather the, recept the serotonin receptors are kind of being occupied so that more serotonin will stay floating around in the brain. But it sounds like that's not what would happen with these oxytocin drugs. So this is actually much more like metformin, which is a drug for uh, adult onset diabetes which increases the number of receptors, of it's receptors. Like receptor. so when you release insulin, it's processed better. So it just increases the, the receptor load. Because yeah. the SSRIs are a little bit of a sledgehammer, aren't they? I, you know, I, I mean, you just kind of feel generally better. And, and that can be therapeutic if you are overly sensitive. Uh, I mean, yeah, I guess that's a difference. They are trying to cure an oversensitivity to certain kinds of stimulus you know, an overly negative response to bad news and stuff, whereas uh, the oxytocin drugs would be heightening a sensitivity. Right. Uh, well, interestingly, SSRIs, uh, oxytocin and uh, serotonin co-release. So SSRIs actually will stimulate a little release of oxytocin as well, which, really? again, is consistent with people who are depressed on SSRIs, so again, mm -hmm. will engage a little more social behaviors that are helpful. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, again, there's, there's lots of chemicals going on. Um, have you even talked about, about bad behavior punishment? Yeah, yeah. quickly, before we, uh, before we depart, let's do talk about testosterone a little. As an example of how these different things can interact. And by the way, my wife and I were wondering about this last night. Is testosterone technically a neurotransmitter or just a, a hormone? Uh, I mean, all neurotransmitters are hormones, right? No. So, no, not true. Right. So, so uh, oxytocin and just a couple other um, neurochemicals work as both hormones and neurotransmitters. So the oxytocin is released both directly in the brain and in the body. Okay. Uh, most other hormones like testosterone, which is made in men mostly in the testes and women, it's made in the adrenals and the ovaries, just leaks into the brain. And then evolution over time has put some testosterone receptors in there, which are, we know associated with things like aggression and risk taking. So this is really interesting, you know, that... So are, so is that a neurotransmitter? If it's present to some extent in the brain, it's still not considered one? It's called a neuromodulator, so it modulates the interactions. So neurotransmitters are, are extremely fast-acting, and things like testosterone are slow-acting in the brain. I see. Yeah. Anyway, it's a technical thing. Uh, testosterone. So in experiments where we administer testosterone to men, which we do because we know it's a potent oxytocin inhibitor, men on testosterone compared to themselves on placebo become more selfish and more entitled. So you and I can attest that the most selfish entitled people on the planet are teenage boys. Right? But at the same time, these high testosterone individuals who are mostly men, then have 10 times the testosterone of women, but sometimes women, will use their own resources to punish people who violate these implicit sharing norms, like being trustworthy. So in particular, in our trust experiments, the less you're trusted as a man, the more your testosterone goes up, and the more you're going to burn your money to hurt that person. So mm -hmm. I think what it means is that we have, again, these rocket thrusters. We have oxytocin that connects us to others. This, oh, look, I care about this person. They seem to be a good person. I don't want to hurt them. That's the positive side. Then you have the negative side, which is, okay, so now you behave bad with me. I'm going to behave really bad with you. So mm -hmm. I think as we're on the planet long enough, we get both those feedbacks to say, look, if you're nice, I should be nice. That's the golden rule. Every culture on the planet has it. And the, the flip side is, particularly for males, if you behave badly, I'm going to behave badly to you, and I'm going to mm -hmm. come for you. And so that's the yin and yang of, of morality, right? I have the positive mm -hmm. side, I have the negative side. So again, again, my claim is we don't need God or government to be moral. We might need a little God, a little government, right? So government gives us these bright lines. So because our brains are bucketed by all these neurochemicals, you know, as we get to the edges, it might be nice to say, hey, society has said, here's the line, in case I'm worried about whether my moral intuitions will fail, which they will. And from a God perspective, you know, you might want to have great books in which people say, look, here's a bunch of rules that you might want to follow. Um, you know, uh, seems to have worked out for the last couple of thousand years. And, and most of those rules are sort of consistent with this golden rule 
internal mm -hmm. mechanism we have. Mm -hmm. So a certain amount of the, the moral regulation of societies is natural. I think it is natural, right? And it, it, it'll, it is natural in the, in the real evolutionary sense. It, it resonates with our own biology. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, if it was something that we just couldn't do, you know, you'd throw those books out eventually. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the same time, some things that some people don't think are optimal, like, uh, like uh, social inequality or, or, or inegalitarianism, you could say have a kind of a natural basis. I mean, serotonin does mediate social hierarchy, right? So we were saying that, that oxytocin rises in response to signs of trust. I, I, I would guess serotonin rises in response to signs of deference, right, among other things. I mean, when people treat you as if, you know, you're superior and your serotonin level rises, right? Sure, the alpha males, but also you get a rise in testosterone. And so, you know, if you win a chess match, your testosterone goes up. So I think, again, being mindful of these chemicals in our brain that are so evolutionary old that we don't really know what they're doing. Um, you know, again, we said prosperity, good, increases happiness, increases tolerance. But at the very high end, if you win the salary lottery or you win the spouse lottery, you know, you marry a supermodel, then your brain's saying, you have the best genes on the planet. You rock. Everyone should be mating with you, should be bowing down to you. So we should not be surprised that presidents and governors and, and you know, captains of industry are having illicit affairs because, as you know, testosterone is associated with sex drive. So um, anyway, so but if you're mindful of that, you can say, look, I've got a nice prefrontal cortex, and even though I have very high testosterone, clearly I do, Bob, um, you know, I can I can suppress the desire to have extramarital affairs or to act like a jerk to suppress my testosterone release. When we said that, you know, last the last thing is testosterone falls for men uh, after age 30. It falls further when you're in a committed relationship. It falls even further when you have children. And I don't have. I'm, I'm three. For, I'm three for three. That explains why I've become such a nice person. Yeah, girly man, right? So yeah. having said that, evolution's setting us up now to be more nurturing. So. So I should say, for, again, for the listeners, there is a high-octane version of testosterone called long name, DHT, and DHT can spike in seconds. So if you're threatened, even though your baseline testosterone may be low, you can turn on the DHT like that. So even if you are a girly man like you and me, you can still mix it up if you need to. That is so reassuring. Yeah. Uh, I will feel much more courageous as I walk down the streets of my dangerous neighborhood. Um, <laughs> Listen, thank you so much, Paul. It's a fascinating read. Uh, what does that sticker say? It says, not for sale. So That's you will right. not get this sticker if you buy this book. That's right. but you, will get, you will get the rest of the book. Um, and uh, congratulations on it. Continue good luck with it. Thank you. And uh, let's do this again sometime. Oh, great fun. Thanks a lot, Bob. Great to be Okay. Bye. Take care.